it was it's called the Chicago Hearing, and you can go to the website www.chicagohearing.org. That was a full day hearing into many aspects of Israel's policy in the occupied territories, in, in the occupied West Bank, including in East Jerusalem and in Gaza. And um, you can, at the back table, get a hold of a, uh, a nicely edited video of the Chicago hearing, or you can pick up um, the, the written report. Does U.S. policy on Israel and Palestine uphold our values? Well, having the, the hearing in Chicago was wonderful, but now we, we're trying to bring some of the energy and information and commitment from that event here to Washington, D.C., and um, delighted to have you all here. This is um, coming toward the end of a number of days of activism organized by the American Friends Service Committee U.S. Campaign to End the Occupation and Interfaith Peace Builders, events that have brought young people from around the country here for advocacy training and um, lots of different events. Leila El Haddad was at an event on, on Saturday evening. She and I were at an event yesterday evening. A lot of organizations around town have been co-hosting events and we've, I think we've really built quite a lot of, of momentum here in Washington, D.C. Um, I moved to the city in 1982, and let me say that nearly 30 years later, it is wonderful to see the activism after the city has been... Um, it, it, has felt, it has felt like a, a very skewed and, and stunted discussion inside Washington, D.C. on Middle East issues for a long time. Now we have a lot of new opportunities, and we have two great speakers here. Um, our first speaker is Leila El Haddad. Leila is a um, writer, analyst, blogger, mother, um, and she has many other talents too, including she's uh, shortly going to be publishing a recipe book. Um, but uh, her latest book, her only book actually, was published as it happens by my company, Just World Books. Um, it's called Gaza Mom, Palestine, Politics, Parenting, and Everything in Between. And it's really a multifaceted look at what it means to be a, a writer and policy analyst and researcher and mother trying to run her life um, in Gaza and between Gaza and the outside because of the limitations on freedom of movement that Leila will be telling us about. Sadly, her long time at this point husband, who is also Palestinian, is not allowed to go to Gaza. So when she wants to go and visit her parents there um, and take her children there, he cannot go. That's just one of the, the kind of the themes in her book. Um, maybe it's one of the things that she'll tell us about today. Leila is just back from a West Coast book tour. She's spoken in many countries around the world um, and is involved in a lot of um, new media activism. You can follow her on Twitter at, at GazaMom, and maybe somebody is live tweeting this hearing. Let's hope. Um, so anyway, without further ado, Leila El Haddad is going to talk to us about the impact of U.S. policy on freedom of movement for Palestinians. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much for coming this early. Um, let me just start by saying when Washington talks about the Israeli occupation, uh, it usually, first of all, doesn't start by referring to it as that, as an occupation. It usually uh, refers to it as a conflict. And when Washington discusses the conflict, uh, finding a resolution to the conflict is generally within the framework of providing security for Israel and easing travel restrictions on Palestinians and addressing their humanitarian needs. This is sort of the refrain you hear uh, whenever Obama is speaking, whenever anyone when is considered to have said something sympathetic to Palestinians. It's usually in that context. Palestinians need you know, humanitarian assistance, Israelis need security. 
And um, it even prompted uh, one Ahmed Musa at the time, uh, head of the Arab League and UN, to, to you know, go out of his you know, scheduled speech and jump onto the microphone in the UN and say, and Palestinians need security too, I remember a few years ago. Um, but it's as though Palestinians were only concerned with food and the occasional reprieve, the occasional opening of a crossing every now and then, the easing uh, of restrictions. And so I want to talk a little bit about this. In, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about this, uh, what I consider this illogical paradigm, uh, but specifically about what these so-called restrictions mean for Palestinians. Because a restriction, when you think of a restriction, and I've often faced this. Um, in speaking with uh, you know Americans who don't know much about the conflict, it sounds like something really inconvenient. At worst, the red line is delayed, the beltway is backed up, the cherry blossom festival means that uh, major streets are closed, and all of this can add up to extensive waits and annoyances. But in the end, there's always another way around, right? You might have to wait for a couple of hours, but you could whatever reroute. Uh, but Israeli checkpoints, border closures, and permits—they do more than simply inconvenience Palestinians. They paralyze life and livelihoods, uh, but they also dysfunctionalize families and economies. They're entrenched and systematic, and they're intended to drive Palestinians from their land, and they make up what Jeff Halper calls the Israeli matrix of control, and there is no other way around. There is no other way around. You just cannot find a way from Gaza to the West Bank, or from the West Bank to Gaza, or when a, a, a border uh, crossing is closed, out of the West Bank, or into the West Bank, or into East Jerusalem. It's the equivalent of being a Maryland resident, which I am, and being told you can never set foot in Washington, D.C., or study at Georgetown, or use Dulles Airport, or take your children to a doctor's appointment at the children's hospital, or marry someone from the district. It's exactly like that. Palestinians in Gaza cannot study at Bizet University. They cannot go uh, to Tel Shemir Hospital. They cannot marry someone from the West Bank and then live together. And these, uh, it's vice versa as well. It also includes Palestinians living in Israel, by the way. They cannot marry Palestinians from the territories either. So let me talk in more detail about how Israel controls Palestinian movement. And I'll try to be brief because you can go on and on about this. But I'm going to begin with Gaza. So there's only one way in and out of the Gaza Strip for most Palestinians. That's the Rafah crossing. And it's jointly controlled by Egyptian uh, and Israeli governments. The Egyptians manage the crossing on the ground, but the overriding system governing who can use it is still an Israeli one. When it is open, only Palestinians with an Israeli-issued ID card, known as the Hawiya, the identity card, can use Rafah crossing to pass into Gaza. Uh, and remember, Gaza is supposed to be the place that is liberated and Israel no longer controlled. That's why this is significant. Israel began issuing these cards when it occupied the Palestinian territories in 1967 and conducted a population census there. And the cards have ever since been used to control Palestinian movement and the Palestinian population registry very significantly. They are location specific. A Gaza ID may only be used to enter Gaza, not the West Bank, and vice versa. And the most stringent conditions are placed on Palestinians carrying East Jerusalem ID cards. The 250,000 Palestinians with these Israeli-issued East Jerusalem ID cards uh, have the same legal status as people who immigrated to Israel, meaning Jews who've gone to Israel, but they're not entitled to citizenship and they're not entitled uh, to a lot of other things. So they're considered non-citizen residents. They can lose their ID cards simply by not uh, being in Jerusalem for five years, by studying abroad, for example. Uh, and by not paying a series of really absurd taxes. All of this can mean that their identity will be revoked and they, just as I was saying, no longer have a right to set foot in the city or live there, that they have been born and raised in their entire lives. In the West Bank, more than 600 checkpoints, barriers, trenches, obstacles, uh, fragment Palestinian land and sever towns from one another. And there too, Israel separation barrier, along with illegal settlements, buffer zones, seam lines, effectively annex half of Palestinian land. Fixing all this requires more than an occasional easing of closures, as I started out by saying, which does little more than ease political pressure and media attention away from politicians and governments. This summer when I was in Gaza, I was continuously told by Palestinians that what they desired was freedom, not food. Freedom to study in the West Bank or other universities like Birzeit or, or abroad, freedom to farm without being killed, which many Palestinian farmers and shepherds frequently are when they are farming their land in the buffer zone, 
freedom to fish more than three nautical miles into sea, which is the latest restriction placed on fishermen there as part of the maritime blockade. Freedom to do the ordinary things that make our lives what they are. But these are exactly the kinds of things that the US policy, the unrestricted aid dollars and blind support of Israel prevent ordinary Palestinians from doing. And as President Obama himself acknowledged in his Cairo speech, Israeli closure policies are strategically unsound and harm Israel's security. But we have yet to see these words transformed into action on the ground. A true freedom of movement, access for both goods and people, because at the moment, pretty much most goods are not being allowed out of Gaza, just as people are not being allowed to. These things require addressing the underlying problem, creating the restrictions to start with, the Israeli occupation and effective control over the Palestinian territories. And as I say, friends don't let friends run an occupation. Mm -hmm. So, while all the attention, or why all the attention on Israel is a frequent retort, so what, there's lots of other repressive regimes. Israel gets more aid from the United States than any other nation on the planet. President Obama, as many of us know, recently approved a $3 billion aid package there. The aid is unrestricted and comes with no strings attached, so it can be used for any purpose. Uh, they don't need to you know, itemize it or whatever, and it doesn't need to be paid back. But the aid is not going to help a struggling developing nation. Not that it usually does, but anyway. The aid goes to, among other things, making sure people like my husband, who is a Palestinian with refugee status, cannot come visit Gaza. Or Ibrahim, a young IT entrepreneur I met this summer in Gaza from attending conferences. Or Mohammed, a young college student in Gaza, from continuing his studies in the West Bank University of Birzeit, from which he was deported by Israeli authorities last year, along with hundreds of other Palestinians. He was literally just plucked, blindfolded, and thrown onto the Arabs crossing and told to go back to Gaza. All of this is in line with the policy to separate Gaza from the West Bank, which is, by the way, now an official declared uh, Israeli policy. Or Amen, a Palestinian from the West Bank currently stuck in Jordan from crossing the Allenby Bridge to rejoin her children and husband in Nablus because she was denied entry to her own home by Israeli authorities on her way back to the West Bank. Or Saha, a Palestinian student from East Jerusalem, for retaining her residency status there because she was studying abroad. This is what our Israel aid dollars do. But they also go to further Palestinian division and embolden the blockade on Gaza, as revealed in the CIA attempt to sabotage Palestinian unity. We should also be clear about what the intentions of Israeli policies towards Palestinians are, because they have been systematic and consistent over the past years. It's not something new. Uh, and the, again, the discourse like would have us believe that it is a response or retaliation to something. It's what the late Israeli scholar Baruch Kimberlin called politicide, a gradual but systematic attempt to cause the annihilation of an independent political and social entity. Now in line with this, it has been Israeli policy for years to prevent viable Palestinian statehood indefinitely. And this isn't, you know, the conspiracy uh, theorist in me or anyone else talking. Ariel Sharon's top advisor referred to the Gaza disengagement of 2005 as formaldehyde, intended to achieve just that, freeze the political process. That was a direct quote from him. It is calculated and premeditated, and it's not a retaliation or self-defense to some latest series of security threats. We should be clear about that. The US-supported blockade on Gaza falls within this framework. Its aim is clear, and I quote, to keep Gaza on the brink of collapse. This is a direct quote from recently revealed WikiLeaks cables between Israeli and American embassies in 2008. And a recent Israeli army presentation elaborates further, explaining that Israeli goals are now to create two separate entities. Sever Gaza from the West Bank and East Jerusalem and prevent the movement of people and goods in and out of Gaza. So in conclusion, we're witnessing tectonic changes in the Arab world, and it is the opinion of some that it is unchartered territory for the United States. The event that has taken place and the events that continue to take place have been unexpected and unpredicted. But critically, they mean the U.S. can no longer support repressive client regimes in the name of maintaining a temporary stability and security at the expense of freedom, civil rights, and human dignity. And Israel is no exception to this. Thank you.
Thank you, Leila. And um, I just want to um, also express thanks to Congressman Jim Moran's office because uh, they have uh, helped us make the arrangements to, to have this session here in the Rayburn House office building today. Um, our next speaker is um, Elik Elhanan, who is an Israeli citizen. Um, Elik was, um, he he's for a long time been a member of the Bereaved Families Forum which is an important group that brings together bereaved families from both the Israeli and the Palestinian communities. Um, as a Quaker, I have to say, I think that this is the most remarkable kind of transformative movement, the Bereaved Families Forum, um, that has grown up in Israel and in the occupied territories over the past 10 to 15 years. Um, Elik is also a member of Combatants for Peace. He's, um, he was a uh, serving member of the Israel Defense Forces, and on completing his service, he refused to serve the normal term of uh, service in, in the reserves for reasons that he will explain. Currently, Elik is a uh, graduate student in, in, at Columbia University, where he's studying He's writing a doctoral dissertation, or maybe he hasn't quite gone to the dissertation yet, I don't know, on um, Hebrew and modern Hebrew and Yiddish poetry. So um, I'm sure he'll bring a, a wonderful literary sensibility to what he tells us this morning as well. Um, please welcome Elik Elhana. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming. Um, well, on the bill, it said I will speak about the impact of uh, military aid um, to Israel. I'm not really going to do that. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more about the experience of living in a militarist society like Israel. But just, well, uh, to get rid of the tension, I'll tell you what I do think about uh, American military aid to Israel and I hope it will make more sense later in the context of, uh, of what I say. I think the impact of military aid to Israel is terrible, is disastrous for the entire region. I think uh, that the military aid to Israel is one of the key factors that are responsible to the, to the fact that we are dying for uh, such a long time, and when I say we, I talk about all the people who die from the actions of my government, be they Israeli or Palestinian or Turkish citizens, uh, or whatever, but I think that the American, well, American policy in general, between the military aid and the veto right, etc., are tantamount to giving, well, free liquor and immunity from prosecution to, uh, well, to the neighborhood drunk. And in top fueling this violent intoxication of the Israeli regime can't in any way be a positive uh, contribution to the, to the conflict um, in our region. Now, speaking about Israel, one has to understand that Israel is a militarist society, through and through. Um, often when we speak about militarist societies, we imagine, well, a Gaddafi-like regime where everybody is in uh, uh, uniforms and medals and uh, the army is present everywhere with big statues of generals in the streets, etc. And then it's very easy for the Israel uh, Apollo apologetics to say, but look, no, Israel is not like that. It's the only democracy in the Middle East. We have also women and other things. <laughs> and the, the reality in Israel is that no, we don't. This is a military state, very much like Prussia at the time. Israel is an army with a state, rather than uh, the other way around. Um, the military is still the most important social fact in Israeli life. 
the quintessential question that an Israeli is asked in order to ascertain well his social standing, etc., would be, where did you serve in the army? According to that question, I can know practically everything about the person uh, I'm talking to. Serving in the military is considered the one way and the only way to gain um, uh, the needed uh, experience, skills and credentials in order to be a politician, a leader, a public opinion uh, shaper, a key person, not only in government, not only in politics, but also in fields of business, in industry, high tech, and surprisingly even in education, where being a, being a fighter pilot is considered a good enough credential to become a headmaster of an elite high school, uh, much better than, for example, let's say a woman, or God forbid, a Palestinian who's been in the education field all their lives, but they have nothing to offer in the field of education, since in such a system also education is understood as a preparatory step to the army. Schools are preparing children to be soldiers, the army is preparing soldiers to be leaders, women are helping men um, with their jobs as defenders and protectors of the nation, and in time also produce more soldiers for the schools to prepare. This is, by and large, the world vision of Israeli society. And the things I'm saying now are not, uh, well, so radical. They are not come from the margins. This is a well-known Israeli problem. The reality in which an army and a state are so closely um, intertwined is something that Israeli, Israeli public and in Israeli discourse it was noted uh, many years ago. And also the, the deep danger that such a situation constitutes for society, since there is an embedded, there is a necessary discrimination in such a system. Um, a system where you get your social standing as a soldier means that only soldiers will have social standing, which means that in the public sphere, as I said, it is important, it is imperative to have military credentials, even to be a leading person in the field of education or public health, etc. Women, Israeli, Palestinian or Israeli citizens, uh, people who do not serve, ultra-Orthodox Jews, etc., etc., that together constitute more than 50% of the Israeli society, are not represented at all, or completely in, a non, in an insignificant manner in the Israeli public sphere. Now, as I said, these things are noted. However, they are treated as a necessary evil. People in Israel say, well, yeah, of course this would be the situation. And in a normal state, this would not have been the case. And the army would have had its own normal place inside society. But Israel is not a normal state. Israel is faced with uh, difficulties and with challenges that no other democracy is faced with. Being an island in a sea of enemies, being attacked by terrorists, being etc., etc., under the constant threat of uh, annihilation. Uh, Israel lives in a unique situation, and that unique situation forces these unique uh, conditions of life on us. And the notion is, if we want to survive in this extremely hostile region, we need to accept um, this unpleasant uh, fact of life and try to deal with it. Uh, this is a convincing argument, this is a compelling argument, this is the argument that underlines most Zionist apologetics about the behavior of Israel. We would have behaved differently, but it's the reality that imposes itself on us. Most Israeli children are raised on this notion, and so was I. Most Israeli children believe this notion, and I did as well when I grew up. 
Um, when I was 18, I finished high school and I joined the army. I did that gladly. I thought that this is the um, one contribution, the most meaningful contribution anyone can give to the state. And growing up in a very liberal, left-wing Zionist home, I believe that uh, an individual should contribute uh, to the collective he's a part of. Um, I joined the military gladly, as I said, I volunteered, I did my service in uh, one of the IDF Special Forces units, and unfortunately there I came across reality, and realized that a lot of this discourse, if not all of this discourse, is not only fictitious, but to a great uh, extent self-serving and serving an interest that I find not only illegitimate but criminal, that interest being the colonization of Palestine. Um, I came to realize that there is no question of defense here, that there is no question of protecting anything, this is not a necessity, that this threat is not imminent and is not permanent and is not existential, but is fabricated and maintained in order to continue this way of life, being its uh, this way of life being the cause of the conflict, not the other way around. Now, I don't want to reduce this to a very simple um, uh, explanation, a very simplistic explanation. One could uh, understand it that, well, yeah, the military, the military has been governing Israel for so many years, now that the world is changing, now that it's clear that there is no military solution to, well, terrorism, that there is no military solution for the Palestinian uh, desires for freedom and independence, <laughs> that the whole world recognizes that, people in Israel, the military in Israel is feeling that it's losing its uh, power, it's losing its grip on society, and therefore it produces this kind of conflict um, deliberately. I think that this such an explanation is way too simple, is much, uh, is not, uh, not satisfying. I do believe many of the Israeli politicians, when they say that they do want peace, they do want to see uh, coexistence with the Palestinians. I just think that since all of our leaders and everybody in a leading position in the Israeli society comes from the same mold and experiences the same basic experiences, was formed by the same people and in the same context, these people are simply incapable of understanding what peace is, are incapable of understanding um, what change means, are incapable of understanding what does it mean to live in a society where dialogue is a principle rather than the hierarchical, uh, uh, rather than a hierarchical structure where you all the people around. Um, I believe that the fact that, that we have been getting and trusting our leaders based on their well ability in the battlefield is the reason that we are stuck right now in this terrible situation uh, Today, these people that showed such magnificent courage in the face of the enemy, Ehud Barak is bragging of killing people so close he could see the white in their eyes. Those people who, who showed such amazing, amazing uh, innovation, where they had to cross enemy borders and uh, murder people in uh, different countries. Ehud Barak again, uh, you know, uh, went as a drag queen when he went out to murder Palestinian poet Hassan Kanafani. This kind of ingeniousness uh, that was able to destroy all of the Arab uh, air force on the ground during the 67 war is completely paralyzed, totally terrified and completely out of wits when it's threatened with peace.
They have no idea what to do in front of that. They have no idea how to deal with this situation and this reality. And therefore they devise tools and techniques to contain it, to make the peace less threatening, to make the peace less unstable. <clears throat> and I think that this approach to peace comes from really being raised in the army, from believing this Israeli truth that the army is part of society, the army does represent society. And people who grow up in the army take this image of society with them and live their lives with it. And what is this image of society? It's a society, it's a very beautiful Israel in the eyes of some people. An Israel that is composed of tough men leading the way, organized in a hierarchical structure, where women are in their right role, supporting, making coffee, encouraging, etc. And where you don't have all those annoying other people. You don't have Palestinians, you don't have ultra-Orthodox, you don't have all kinds of leftist, gay people, backstabbers, those kind of people. You have a nice, ordered society. Now the realization that society is composed of many voices, that society is composed of many ideas, that there is, should be a dialogue, a real dialogue between different people who have real positions of subjects that can relate to one another as equal individuals, this is a concept that cannot exist inside the military mind. Where logic and hierarchy has to decide <coughs> everything. Once this system collapses, any threat to this system is a threat, an existential threat. This is why for Israeli leaders what is happening in Tahrir Square is such a threat. This is why Israeli leaders can find themselves on the side of Gaddafi right now. This is why Israeli leaders think that a boat carrying humanitarian aid to Gaza should be stopped using commando and navy seals. This is why Israeli leaders are so afraid of uh, Palestinian students, of Palestinian scholars, of Palestinian intellectuals. Everything that can spoil this very, very neat image of the world is hazardous. Hazardous to Israel in their understanding, hazardous to the region in their understanding because it can, it prevent their ability to maintain control. Now, for me personally, growing up as a soldier, growing up in this system and understanding what it means and what it can do to people, it became a goal to disrupt the system and to ruin it. If it's through the family forum, going and meeting the people on the other side that allegedly are supposed to hate me the most, the people whose children died by my hands, and that my family died by their hands, meeting the, having this kind of impossible dialogue is one way of breaking this enemy friend or foe mentality. Another one is what we do in Combatants for Peace, where Israeli soldiers who refuse openly to participate in any of the actions of the occupation go and meet Palestinian fighters in order to try and talk and find a way in solidarity to resist the occupation. Doing these things, name and mainly not believing the hierarchy of Israeli society, is I think the best way um, to counter this kind of attitudes from within. But as long as this delusion, as long as this belief that only power can maintain um, can maintain Israel where it is, that only we can live only on the soul, as long as this delusion persists, our fight is an up is an uphill fight and an extremely difficult one and this delusion will go on and this I say without a doubt this delusion will go on 
as long as you keep financing it. And once you stop, maybe Israel will have to think rationally. But as long as you finance this addiction to violence, we will have... Uh, change will be almost impossible. Cut us off. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can heal. Maybe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alik. Um, I guess I, I noticed a, a big convergence between what our two speakers, um, their kind of takeaway line. It's that, um, as Leila said, friends don't let friends run an occupation. And it's the role of the US as hoping to be a good friend, I would hope, my government would be a good friend to all the peoples of the region, the Israeli people and the Palestinian people and all the other peoples of the region. As a friend, what would our responsibility be? So that's that's something that we can all take away to think about. Um, Leila, you, you alluded to the fact that the, by the way, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just seed a couple of questions here and then I, I'm going to invite questions from the rest of you. Um, Leila alluded to the fact that the occupation is not just like, you know, the red line gets backed up, which for all of us who live in D.C., you know, that's a very frequent thing and it, it's annoying and you lose, you know, maybe a couple of hours and you build up your frustration, but the, the occupation has been going on for 44 years um, and with various degrees of um, limitations, sometimes lifted a little, sometimes not lifted a little, but always this idea that the occupying authority, just as for our US occupation in Iraq, has the overriding control over what happens until you end the occupation. So what has the effect of that 44 years been on the Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza, on family life? Give us a couple of examples over 44 years, how that works out. Well, it, com it completely, completely severs and um, you know, violates the social fabric of society. Uh, and I had given a few examples, but it's, you know, it's also not just obviously Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. It's Palestinians, hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees and refugee camps outside of the West Bank and Gaza who feel the impact of this if they for example, by the mere fact that they're not allowed to go back to their native homes, and many have family or intermarried to Palestinians there. So this is probably one of the biggest ways is by, um, I mentioned Israeli control over the population registry. Well, that means if you have a child, Israel controls whether or not that child becomes a Palestinian uh, national and then can be added to your ID card and then is allowed into uh, either the Gaza Strip or the West Bank or East Jerusalem. But if, if that is allowed, then adding a spouse is not allowed. So that's how they, in effect, violate Palestinian life and sever the social fabric, by doing that, by not allowing for what's known as family reunification, this process, Jema Shemin, in which spouses who may be from different Palestinian territories or even different uh, refugee camps can intermarry. So, and then, if you are someone, for example, from Gaza, married to someone from the West Bank, you then have to decide, if you, if you do indeed have the ID cards, where do you want your children to be added, to which ID card? You can't do both. And that means you can't live in either location. You have to choose. Uh, and in cases like mine, where my husband does not have an ID card, he can't come at all. So when I go, I go alone with the children, and he can't come with me. And I gave you know, many other examples. Palestinians, even who are citizens of Israel, 1948 Palestinians, as we refer to them, they too, there's a law, the family reunification law, that prevents them from giving the citizenship to Palestinians if they're married to a Palestinian from the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. They can't give them the citizenship. They can't reside together or get the ID card and live together as one unit. So that, this is, I mean, it is these small, quiet, seemingly banal moments that actually, uh, you know, uh, are the, the harshest when it comes to uh, the Israeli occupation, the understanding the effects of occupation uh, on family life. Thank you. Um, Alik, I guess my question for you is, if, can you share with us a bit more how you got out of that paradigm that you described? You know, it seems that something happened during your, your military service. Um, you came out of the paradigm and, and became able to view it with a, a 
critical view from still within Israeli society, but from outside of the paradigm. How did that happen? Is it happening a lot inside Israel? Because when I go to Israel, I, I see a society you know, that seems very happy and insouciant and you know, you sit in a, in a cafe in North Tel Aviv and you, you go to a shopping mall and like, it doesn't seem like a troubled society. So, so what leads people to the kind, uh, what, what leads people to the kind of um, transformation that you went through and what can US policy do to actually uh, help people come to a, a more <coughs> mature understanding of the, the bad effects of militarism in Israeli society? Oh wow, that's a that's a lot there. Um, well, um, one would love to have such a dramatic moment, a moment where everything changed, a moment when I just realized and after that things were different, this kind of moment of awakening or coming into a wellness or something like that. Um, in all honesty, for me, I didn't, I didn't really have uh, such a moment Uh, per se, if you want, for me the moment was much more uh, political. I knew beforehand that the paradigm was wrong. As I said, uh, I grew up in a, well, I grew up in a very liberal, very left-wing uh, Zionist family. My grandfather was a military man, but also uh, was the person who initiated contact with the PLO in the 70s. Um, was a very active fighter for Palestinian, uh, for the Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace and for the end of the occupation. I knew, I knew most of these things uh, before I went to the army. Um, simply like many, many Israelis, I didn't follow... Uh, I accepted. I was willing to accept an illogical, uh, this illogical uh, conclusion that said, yeah, we really want peace, but we really need the army, and these two things can co co coexist uh, together. And in that respect, saying now, I say that, well, basically, I didn't want to go through, I didn't want to face the price of realizing this thing too early. During my military service, uh, serving in the occupied territories and in Lebanon, I came to see, as I said, uh, as I said before, that there is between what I'm doing and the declared policies of my government, there is hardly any, there is hardly any connection. We were told that we we're being in Lebanon to protect the the citizens of the north of Israel, but this was evidently not the case. The citizens in the north of Israel was hurt exactly because we were in south of Lebanon. Um, etc. etc. Examples, I, I can give many many examples, but slowly and slowly it became clear to me that what I'm doing is not well, what I thought I would be doing. And at a certain point the realization came that yeah, okay, I, you know, I have to recognize that uh, I've been lied to. From that moment, moving uh, to actual action, that was, uh, that was where the dramatic uh, event had to happen. I realized that the paradigm was wrong, but deciding to leave it, um, that took, well, uh, two, two different uh, events. Uh, in my last year in the military, when I was in the military, uh, my sister was killed in a suicide bombing. Uh, Hamas uh, suicide bombers blew themselves up in the center of Jerusalem. They killed uh, three little girls. Among them uh, was my sister, who was uh, 14. Uh, something that really put to question this notion that I was defending the citizens of Israel at the time. I was, well, I don't know what, training for something. And this happened 
10, 15 meters from uh, my door. And I remember after that happened, the only answer that people had to give me was either some kind of quiet uh, resignation, you know, this is the will of God or some nonsense like that, or revenge. And the idea of revenge made so much sense to people that I thought highly of, that I would think do not work in this kind of uh, logic. I remember my commander in the army, who was a person I, I appreciated, told me that he thinks I shouldn't stay at home, I should come back to the unit as soon as possible, I should um, I reintegrate myself in activity, and he said, yeah, you know, there's a big operation being planned in Lebanon, and I want you to take an active part in it, and then he said, and maybe, you know, maybe we'll encounter uh, Hezbollah terrorists, and you'll be able to even the score. And I think for me, this was a very important moment in understanding uh, how psychotic exactly is the place I grew up in. And this is the problem with like psychotics, they do look normal until you understand that they have absolutely no connection to reality. And understanding that there is this person, an intelligent, thoughtful, probably in his own eyes, liberal person, who thinks that somehow there is some kind of a logical construction where killing a Shiite in Lebanon would avenge something a Palestinian did in Jerusalem, somehow that makes sense. And this point of view, maybe I couldn't find a way to look at this point of view that would not consider it both insane and profoundly racist. Uh, for me, that was the moment where I decided I don't want to be a part of, of this game anymore. They can kill and they can die, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. Later on, and that is the meaningful thing, moving to, from a personal decision to a political action, for that, a uh, conscientious objection movement had to be created in Israel. And once that movement, Courage to Refuse, um, was created in 2002, I understood that there is a political significance to conscientious objection. And this is the moment where I declared and said openly that I will not serve in this army of occupation. Now, you asked if there's many people uh, like that in Israel. Well, yes and no. There are many. There are more than we ever imagined. There are more than I think that I don't think that there is a many historical precedents for this kind of a conscientious objection movement. However, there aren't enough. We're way too many, way too less. There was way too many people who find it still very comfortable to live inside the paradigm or not criticize it openly. Um, one answer to this problem is simply not to go to a coffee place in the north of Tel Aviv. <laughs> The other is to engage these people in debates, in uh, talks, to, um, uh, to make them question their beliefs, to make them understand that there is absolutely no logic, there's nothing coherent behind the way they view the world. And people do come to realize this. After each uh, unspeakable atrocity that Israel committed in the last well, since we've created Combatants for Peace, more and more and more people joined the group. Now, Combatants for Peace is a group that started with 11 people. Today, we're over 500. So, there is definitely a movement, but too slow. And, and as always the case, we get people, when the center fails on both extremes, people profit. Our camps is growing, but also the extreme right camp is growing as a result of the same dynamic. What to think about. Um, I'd like to invite questions from the floor. Um, if you're from a congressional office, do tell us um, whose office you're from. Um, maybe, and also, if you're not, obviously, we also want to know who you are. 
Um, so, uh, yes. I'm not, excuse me, I'm not from the Congressional Office, I'm from the Korean Party. Um, my question is historical. Uh, my memory isn't exact, so excuse that. But in the past five, six years, I have twice uh, been invited to the Jewish Community Center on 6th Street to hear four or five um, Israelis who were refusenics and, um, and they gave their story and their reasons, etc. And uh, now, for instance, one of them, the youngest one, he had refused to serve altogether. He just gave the story, said, my father has four brothers, they all served, they're all outraged that they're just giving the story of what it's like he was refusing to serve. My question is, uh, well, nothing, that group, I thought, oh, now it's starting, now we can grow. But it didn't grow. So I wonder if you knew, I don't have a name, it's a, maybe you were one of those people. <laughs> I'm just trying to get a history of Um Maybe I was, I can't, I can't remember. No. Um, look. Okay. There was a very a great philosopher, a very important person in Israel called Ishayal Leibovitch. I don't know if any of you heard of him, but for many of us in the Israeli left, this was the brightest, clearest mind that ever existed in Israel. A parallel to an Israeli uh, Dr. King. And the fact that he, while Alec Sharon is very famous, he is completely unknown, says, uh, I think, a lot about uh, what, I have, what I'm be I've been saying here. But anyway, this uh, remarkable person said, um, that the day 500 of Israel's finest will refuse, the government will have to, the earth will shake. The government will have to take us seriously. <coughs> and he's been calling for conscientious objection <coughs> since 67, this person. My grandfather, or the Professor Mati Pella, they, probably some of you have a chance to meet him when he was doing this kind of talks 10, 20 and 30 years ago, um, was calling for conscientious objection since 1982, since the engagement in Lebanon, um, which is when it started. The movements like Yesh Gvul and others have been promoting conscientious objection since then, throughout the First Intifada and onward. And somewhere this was the goal, this was the objective. We believe, like, you know, the myth of the Great Strike, or I don't know, all kind of this uh, pseudo political religious beliefs that there is this number that will reach it and things will change and it seemed plausible because in Israel nothing was worse than uh, not serving in the military um, well I imagine there's quite a few Jews in the crowd here and if you remember in the telling of the story of Passover there are the four there are the four kids who ask uh, what is the story of Passover? And there you have this uh, very clear line that states exactly what is the problem of conscientious objection in Israel. The text says very clearly, a person who disengage, who separates himself from the community as if separated himself from God, committed an act of sacrilege. And this is the Israeli notion. You separate yourself from the collective, you committed the worst kind of sacrilege. And we lived in the notion, I remember when I started uh, being active in combatants in uh, Courage to Refuse, that this is a monumental event when Courage to Refuse was created, because 52 people wrote the initial, signed the initial declaration, within a week there was 170, within two weeks there were 350, and we could see, well, the rupture is coming. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't live in uh, children's fairy tales, and it doesn't work like that. The earth didn't move, there was nothing shake. However, we became a constant fact in Israeli politics and Israeli political discourse. 
Today there are more than 2,500 people in Israel who refuse to serve, either altogether or uh, reserve, but in the different organizations we count more than 2,500. Now I know that this is a very big number, not big enough, but it is a very big number. We are present in many places. I can. The army takes us into consideration in the fact that they are worried about using reserve soldiers now because they are worried about rebellion, about people refusing, people disobeying orders. In the same document that you quoted before, Dov uh, Weissglass, uh, Sharon's consigliere, was saying that uh, it was the refuseniks and the uh, other threatening dangers, other dangers to the existence of Israel, like the Geneva Accord and stuff like that, that pushed them forward for the disengagement. Now, we became an existing fact in Israeli discourse. So, we didn't have the impact we expected, but we did have a very big impact still. However, we became a fact in Israeli discourse. Just another point of view inside this liberal soup where uh, I am for the occupation, you are against the occupation, and in the meantime, everything is going to hell behind us. We are not interested in that. This is why we moved away from the question of conscientious objection and created Combatants for Peace, where the emphasis is on going across and really engaging in on-the-ground, grassroots activism in solidarity with Palestinian uh, non-violent resistors. Because uh, we realized that, yeah, saying no, refusing to serve the occupation, refusing, refusing to contribute to this crime, is the first and indispensable step. But it's only the first and indispensable step. There are many, many, many others later. And this is where we direct our attention right now. Um, I have a question if nobody else wants to. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I guess what we, what we need is either congressional or presidential action to some of the things you asked for. Is there anything in the, in the air of uh, unrest in the North Africa Middle East? And the somewhat embarrassment of um, to the U.S. government for having supported regimes which now are being popularly overthrown, apparently, you don't know the end of the Is there any kind of opportunity here, any sort of argument that can be made that will, that will help either the President or members of Congress say what they haven't been able to say to this point? Do we have a, is there a, is there a good moment now? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, there's never been a, a better time. Um, of course, the question is still, it remains to be seen, obviously, what the impact of all this is, because it's, um, it's really Egypt that, you know, okay, Mubarak resigned, but really the regime is not, he is not there, right? But the, the structure is still there, the military is still in control. And so what the United States is doing, shuffling its cards, figuring out a new way to deal with all of this, um, you know, we don't know what's going on yet, I guess, behind closed doors. But it is an opportunity because that traditional paradigm is collapsing. And it's a time when they're maybe forming a new one. And so it is a significant time to be able to say, well, you know. And then even if it doesn't happen from the United States, there's now a form of accountability, but you know, from the Arab people themselves, who I think now realize that we were able to do this, and we can also stand up to the United States and say this isn't going to fly with us. Um, but in terms of specific suggestions of what to be able to tell Congress regarding their policies on to Arab countries, or specifically on Palestine, Israel, you mean, or just in general? Yeah, obviously Congress is very reluctant to say anything. against Israel or against aid, if you want, you know, if you want the uh, aid to stop, that's a very, very hard thing for most politicians to say. So, you know, we, we, I'm just wondering whether there's any kind of argument here that can help, help out our, our government. If you can say anything, I just 
weren't politically acceptable before. Now, I may be completely wrong, but this isn't a good time to, to bring this up. Um, no, I think it's an excellent time to bring uh, this up. I think one argument that they probably won't accept and won't like hearing is that, well, right now, the United States, well, not right now, but for a long time, but right now, it's a moment that this could be changed. The United States is paying the price of its hypocrisy. Like, on the agenda of bringing democracy, of bringing development, of bringing uh, et cetera, et cetera, for most of the, uh, more, uh, everywhere in the world, USAID became uh, synonymous to oppression, to worsen conditions, to the destruction of social fiber, to the neoliberalization of all society. These are the reasons that stand behind what we see today in, uh, in Egypt and in other places. Um, the United States should be held accountable for transforming all the values of the West into a sham, into something that is, cannot be taken seriously. And I think this is a point where one can say to um, the American political system that it's a time that this system itself should uphold its own values. One thing specifically in, the, um, in our context is maybe to remind uh, that system to uphold its own signed uh, agreements. Now everybody's talking and everybody's really worried what will happen, the peace with Israel, the peace in Israel and Egypt, will they respect it, will they not? What will happen now that there is a popular voice and democracy in Egypt, what will happen with peace? Uh, I think an excellent point to make is that one of the reasons that there's such popular antagonism towards this peace it's that Israel and the United States do not respect its terms. Where it said specifically in the document signed by Israel and the United States that this peace is dependent on respecting the rights of the Palestinians. And now might be a time for the United States to think about asking well, both parties to uphold their end of the deal that the United States itself signed. This is not some abstract uh, idealist commitment. This is a commitment that the United States took and is not upholding. And maybe now it's a moment to rethink that. Yeah, if I could just uh, add in a couple of points there. I would note that, you know, when the Mubarak family was tottering on the edge, um, and it's a question how much the regime as such has gone, but I, I think I'm a little more optimistic than Leila. I think the regime has changed and the, the popular movement continues to push. Um, as the Mubarak family was teetering on the edge there, clearly the Obama administration was having very deep discussions as to, you know, well, should we call for change? Uh, members of the administration between the Secretary of State and, and the White House and so on. To support, you know, popular movements that call for democracy and accountability. So if they do that in Egypt, why do we not see, you know, a, a similarly strong call for accountability? Um, and for you know, respecting the popular will, and for the end of military occupation directed toward Israel. I think the idea of an Israeli exception to this region-wide um, call for accountable governments um, is, is, is an excellent time to talk about that. And also to look at you know, how many billions of dollars did we pour into the Israeli, into the Egyptian military? And actually, at the end of the day, what, how has that served our people's interests. A another good question that maybe you know you can put across the border as well. <laughs> um, yeah, you had a question. A uh, question for both presenters. Uh, from Lila, you mentioned in passing the CIA attempt to sabotage Palestinian unity. Could you elaborate on that for those of us who are not familiar with that? Sure. In um, following the. Um, the 2006 Palestinian elections, which 
um, you know, just kind of backing up. A lot of people keep saying, oh, what, you know, when is it the Palestinian turn to, um, you know, to have the Palestinian to hate and so forth. And I usually say, well, they kind of, you know, if we're talking about the Israeli occupation, they've kind of already been doing that for a long time, the first Intifada, the second Intifada. But if we're talking specifically about a change of Palestinian government, they did that in the 2006 elections, perhaps the first case in the Arab Middle East, the most democratic elections. And of course, that wasn't um, at all expected again. Um, and uh, the result was the United States had devised a strategy to try to uh, get rid of the um, the party that had won, the Hamas's change and reform movement. Uh, and so what happened was that they began to finance and arm uh, Mohammed de Halan, a Palestinian uh, politician considered a strong man w within the Fatah movement, uh, and, um, and to kind of essentially sow chaos uh, in Gaza and eventually uh, uh, wage a coup against the uh, government and overthrow them. Well, in March of 2007, um, despite all of this, uh, a unity government was formed, brokered during the Mecca agreement, and that lasted uh, for about a month or two, maybe, something like that, three, three months. And, uh, but this plan, these, um, these, it, it was a, uh, the same person, Elliot Abrams, who basically was responsible for the iran Contra scandal, was in charge of this. Uh, plot and uh, gave Mohammed Ahlan something in, by way of 184 million dollars or more. Uh, and um, I was there at the time. We saw the the troops coming in through the Rafah crossing that were armed and financed. And then again, just complete chaos on the streets. And nobody knew when it was starting, how it was starting, uh, the the infighting. And then eventually, um, you know, Hamas caught wind of this and in a preemptive coup uh, was able to to stop this. And then. Didn't, had more gains than they expected, and the end result was that Fatah was evicted to the West Bank, and then Hamas retained control over Gaza. But it was all, and then a lot of people were saying at the time, oh, but you know, could this be outside involvement? But then usually people, no, no, don't be a conspiracy theorist, whatever. And there was a brief article in the Jordanian newspaper that was quickly actually whisked away from the press, talking about there was a leak about well, this could be a CIA thing. But it wasn't until this Vanity Fair article called the Gaza Bombshell was published detailing all of this information with, with um, leaked uh, CIA documents um, that this really kind of came to the mainstream. I mean, people kind of suspected it, but it wasn't until this article was written that it became very clear. So there were a lot of, obviously, things going on. Yeah, if you're interested in reading that, it's called Gaza Bombshells. Yeah. Or, 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 uh, do people with your views have access to the mainstream media in Israel for letters to the editor and uh, opinion pieces? No. <laughs> uh, well, the, the answer is, of course, more complicated uh, than that. Um, well, very much like here, you know, we, we don't have censorship in Israel. And there's no control of uh, newspapers and media. There is a uh, market censorship. Very much like here, editors only publish what they think people want to read, and they don't think people want to read about stuff like us. You have uh, one newspaper like Haaretz, who likes to pretend that it's uh, some European relic of the old world that doesn't have anything to do with Israel, so they publish what everybody else doesn't want to read, so we can publish stuff there. But maybe 5% read Haaretz, and even there we are one voice among many. Um, we get into the media when we are able to generate a big enough provocation. But uh, I must say that uh, one of the reasons that we broke away from courage to refuse and started Combatants for Peace, and one of the early decisions that we had in Combatants for Peace, is that we've had enough. I don't think media, well, journalists today understand what journalism means. I don't think that media is doing its role. I think when all this will be over, many, many, many journalists will have to answer for what they did. In Rwanda, they stood trial for the way they covered uh, for crimes against humanity for the coverage. I believe the same will have to take place in Israel as well. 
We do not want to be prostitutes of the media anymore. We will not direct our actions to them. We create news. We create real change in the world. When we do solidarity activities in the West Bank, we create news, uh, well, on a human level. We create news on a political level. We create news during exactly the time that uh, you mentioned right now of, that, uh, of the violence uh, between Hamas and Fatah in Gaza, we managed to bring together uh, in an event um, Israeli activists together with Palestinian activists, Palestinian activists that came the grassroots activists that came the, in the declared intention of giving a show of unity, covering the whole political spectrum of uh, of Palestinian parties, from uh, Hamas on to the Popular Front, and in uh, anti-settler uh, activity, and the media never bothered to come there. Who cares about these things? Later, somebody, a kid, threw a bottle at the car, and then we had media, loads of media. So we decided, you know, we don't. We don't care, we are not going to play according to them. We, find, we try to find other ways, alternative ways, different ways to do politics. But believing that you actually need the, the, the media, we're done with that. <laughs> Um, I just have one last question for later because it really we don't often have somebody from Gaza here on Capitol Hill. So, you know, if you if you could talk to the, the members of Congress and to the staff members and to the senators, what would be your principal request from them? Do you want to have more access between Gaza and the outside world or between Gaza and the West Bank? Do you want to have um, an opening to Egypt? Um, <coughs> What if, you know, you don't obviously claim to represent all the people of Gaza, but what do you think the people of Gaza would ask most from the U.S. Congress? Um, freedom. I mean, and freedom in all sense of the word. That's what I kept hearing this summer. They kept saying, we don't want food, we don't want humanitarian assistance. More than 80% of the Palestinians in Gaza are food uh, insecure or food vulnerable, meaning they're dependent on food aid in some form or fashion completely or becoming very close to getting to that point. And they don't want to be there. They want employment. They want jobs. They want to be productive. And these are all things that the blockade that we in the United States support specifically prevent from happening. So the goal, actually, is to prevent is no uh, productivity, what is it, no development, no prosperity, no humanitarian uh, crisis. Those are the three goals of the blockade. They work very carefully towards making sure people don't have jobs and are not productive and factories keep remain closed and students can't go out to study and books don't get in. And so that's what they want. They want the blockade to end. And that is a first step, of course, because they don't want Gaza to be separate from the West Bank. They want the blockade to end in all forms and fashions, whether the maritime blockade, the land blockade, the crossings to be open not one half of one percent of the year, you know, the whole time, they want Palestinians to have control over their side of the crossings, not a back-to-back -back cargo system on Carney Crossing. They want the Rafah Crossing to be open and the agreement on movement and access brokered by Condoleezza Rice in 2005 to be tossed out because that's been expired, but that's what the U.S. continues to reference when it talks about opening the Rafah Crossing. So, yeah, that's, um, that's what they want. <laughs> yeah, um, I just wanted to add a word to what you said, um, that the, the, the very inability to understand that is the result of the militaristic thinking in Israel. Uh, the notion that Palestinians, well, that doesn't, doesn't have to be Palestinians, but that uh, the other doesn't have a will of its own, doesn't, that it only needs and only needs to satisfy, you know, give them jobs, give them food, give them then what are they complaining? Because the notion of independence, the notion of freedom, the notion of being able to decide for yourself and that this is a sacred right in its own, this is something that the military mind cannot understand. That it's not enough to keep them healthy and uh, well fed. You also can't think of them anymore as them, and you actually have to ask them what they want. This is a leap that the militarist state of mind is unable to make. 
Yeah, building on that, um, a good friend of Leila's um, is quoted in her book as saying, you know, that actually the situation of the Palestinians in Gaza is worse than the, that of prisoners in an open air prison. It's that of animals in a zoo because even prisoners are recognized to have rights, whereas nobody considers that you know animals well. They don't have rights in the same way that humans have rights. And, and fed, right. <laughs> up to a point. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's a very powerful point in her book. I think we should probably wrap up now, and I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to especially thank Elik and, and Leila for giving really some very rich insight into this whole question and giving us as American voters and citizens, uh, people involved in the legislative process here, a lot to think about. Um, we haven't gone perhaps as deeply as we might have into the details of this or that military aid program, but I think that you know it's it, it's absolutely unavoidable when you look at U.S. aid programs in the Middle East, how strongly they are skewed toward military aid. And they just requested another million. Yeah, and Leila is saying there's another request from Israel coming in for military aid. And I know that a lot of the, the lobbying that goes on here, um, even amongst um, groups that, that are doing some work for peace, keeps the whole question of military aid off the table, or even they may be saying, well, you know, we are pro-Israel, pro-peace, therefore we want to increase the military aid to Israel to prove how pro-Israel we are. But it's important for us to note that that, that skew of aid towards military aid has had consequences throughout the whole region, and it has consequences in terms of the effects it has on Israeli society and on Palestinian society. So um, we can't come away with any perhaps concrete legislative initiatives or ideas for, for concrete legislative things at this point, but we can come away with the idea that there is a, a different way to look at the responsibility of friends. The responsibility of friends is not just to continue pumping up military establishments that throughout the region have not proven, or have rather have proven that they cannot do what they claim to do, which is to assure the well-being of the peoples of the region and of our country. So I want to thank you all for coming. Um, we're living in very exciting times in the Middle East. I know there's a lot of emphasis in the media on what's happening in Libya, and that is very tragic. But we need to remember, too, that this is an issue that has been going on for 44 years for Palestinians. And from time to time, it makes headlines when there's an, you know, an escalation in the conflict. But it really is the day-to-day -day grinding down of people's wills the day-to-day -day ruptures inside families that Leila has described that carry on and that carry on largely because our aid to Israel is not conditioned and is not accountable. So please go and uh, get copies of the, um, of, of the super video, copies of, of the uh, written report here. Go to the website and um, there's a lot more that we can think of doing in, in the future. Big thanks again to Representative Jim Moran for, for helping us hold this thing here, hold, hold this event. Big thanks to the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation to interfaith peace builders.